Right. So now question to you, how can we measure performance of 2D model? So 2D model, two-dimensional model calculates uh, water levels and velocities at each grid cell. So you may have 100,000 grid, grid points in the grid cell here, and for each of them you would have values of velocities and uh, water level, and perhaps flows. But in hydrodynamic model, you would have uh, water levels for each point. So as you know, uh, flood damage depends not only on water level, it depends on velocity at that point, and also residence time, so for how long water stays. And there is a nonlinear function. If water passes by quickly, then there is not much damage, for example, for, for agriculture. But if water stays longer, then c crop is completely destroyed. So it's important to know the residence time for how long the water stays. Say, in Asia, it's often like 30 centimeters, then rice crop was damaged and so on. So how to measure performance of this model now? Don't look here, so I'm asking you if we are running 2D model, how to measure its performance. It's a much more complex picture than in simple lumped model. Well, actually, it's a, it's a tricky thing. And the main thing is that you don't have data to measure performance. To measure performance, you have to compare outputs to something measured. And during floods, you don't measure velocities and at each grid cell point, right? So then there is a problem. So you have to find the ways to measure performance at least somehow. So for example, satellite photos of inundated areas may help. But remember, satellite may uh, make a photo once in, in several days. So it would perhaps the photo you see later in these satellite images made not during the maximum possible flood extent. So you have to also collect data from the field. People who live there, they would know what was flooded, what is not. So it's additional data. So all this data you have to collect and only then you will be able to somehow calibrate the model. But calibration is not terribly accurate. Also velocities you cannot measure at each point. You measure sometimes velocities in the, in the uh, rivers. So currently we have movies when you see flooded areas and river flows. Uh, you can watch this movie and there is automatic software that analyzes the flow and calculates velocity of the flow using uh, footages, the videos. So you can do it. But again, it's only at one point where this movie was made. In other points, you cannot do it. So there is no clear answer to this uh, uh, question. So you have to try to look at depth, velocity, and residence time. If you have it, if not, then you have to live with what you have. You try to reproduce physical pictures as close to the possible, as possible to reality, and perhaps that's better than calibrating model against the wrong data. So Jean Kunz even wrote a paper in, uh, it was end of the 90s, on data and models in Journal of Hydroinformatics, where he claims that it's wrong to calibrate river models at all, because data is so bad that there is no sense. You better look at physics and physical reality and put the parameters of the model based on your experience and physical reality than trying to fit model to the data. So that's also have to take into account. Read this paper, nice paper, on data and models. It's called Jean Kunz. Right. But, again, we assumed we have good data. So let's look at the process of calibration of the model with the objective of minimizing the model error. So that's what we want to do. So. In fact, I would be repeating what I already said. So we have a physical system. It means your catchment or river or maybe sediment process or urban network, water distribution network, whatever you look at. You have some output. So in, uh, in hydrological, it would be, for example, flow. In water distribution system, it could be pressure head. It 
a certain point in drainage model, it would be outflow, which you want to minimize. And this is the model. You compare <coughs> model to the observed data. Again, it's past data, don't forget. We calculate the error. So model output is denoted <coughs> by y caret on top. But I was lazy to use equation editor. So this caret comes after y, but it should be on top, actually. It's assessment of output y. And this is observed output y. You calculate error. And if error is small enough, you stop calibration. If not, you change this parameters of the model. You see this theta, which we used here, it's p. So it's a vector of parameters that we have to change. You change it, you run model again, you look at the error, not good. <coughs> you change parameters again, you run the model, not good, and you continue until model becomes good. This is what we did by manual calibration, if you remember. So, this problem is optimization problem. So it means we have objective function, which is model error, like nash sutcliffe efficiency. Well, nash sutcliffe want to maximize, but error want to minimize. OK, let's talk about root mean squared error. So decision variables are model parameters in this optimization problem. <coughs> so we have to identify this unknown parameters. And there are constraints. So there could be different constraints, and one of them is ranges. You remember I showed you file ranges of parameters. That file is used to calibrate the model and want to impose some ranges uh, for these parameters. It's additional knowledge of physics you need to understand in what range these parameters should be. So let's assume we use root mean squared error to calibrate uh, the model to minimize this uh, error. And in this model, in this <coughs> sorry, equation, Q observed is a number which is given. There are no parameters there. It's just measured value, which is presented as table or vector time series. But QM is calculated, and it depends on the uh, parameter P. So there is something in it. And Q model is not a formula. In our simple lumped conceptual model, you can write down the formula for this QM. But in the more complex models, you cannot. It's software. So there are thousands of lines of code that calculate this QM. So there is no formula. There is if-then-else rules, God knows what. Numerical methods, solvers, and so on. So there is no formula. It means you can calculate a value of QM for every, any given input P, but you, ca you cannot express it analytically. And this makes problem difficult because you cannot use uh, traditional methods of optimization where we assume nice functions here in the objective function. So we have to use randomized search or direct search, like genetic algorithms and stuff like this. Now, P here is a vector. So in our model, we had eight parameters. So we solve eight-dimensional optimization problem. We have to identify eight numbers that would give you the best model. So again, objective function is this. Decision variables are listed here. We have to identify them. And constraints, we discussed, there is a range uh, for each parameter. There is a range of parameters that we use. And there could be more constraints. So for example, one constraint is, you remember elevation in that model we used. Where is my model? So these elevations here. This elevation of this point cannot be higher than this. Right? So it's additional constraints we impose on D1, D2. And there could be many more constraints which are imposed on also hydrological parameters that we're uh, using. So the, we have to remember this. So this we already did. It's part of presentation here, but we already did it because I wanted to introduce this model earlier than this. So you had this already. We discussed this. And trial and error procedure we had. It's just listed here on the slide now for your future uh, review. We run the model, calculate error. If error is high, it just parameters go to uh, step one. And this is this trial and error uh, calibration that uh, we are using. So Gavara actually described uh, when he was first developing this model, he described uh, quite efficient trial and error procedure for hydrologists uh, that they should follow 
in which order to change this parameter. So you can find his in his papers of the 60s and 70s when he was uh, doing this. But okay, for this model it's a trivial example, it's easy. But for complex models you cannot use these procedures, it would be very difficult. So that's why we use automatic calibration routines and I will later demonstrate uh, uh, to you how to do it. Okay, we discuss it later when we do uh, optimization, I suggest, because then you would understand what methods do we use. So we'll use this tool, Globe. You, I send you the copy. Please open this. You can install it, but the problem is when I developed it, uh, standard software was able to write data into program files folder. Not anymore since Windows 7. So you cannot write by software anything changed there. So that's why you open the folder, not now, but we'll do it later when we talk about optimization. Now, calibration, cross-validation and testing. We'll talk about this now and we'll talk more about this during data-driven modeling when we discuss it. Why? Because it's a very important subject which is not covered well in practically uh, anywhere. So people do different things, even in papers of good authors this aspect is not really taken seriously. So let's think together what should we do when we calibrate the model. So we take the data set uh, for model calibration, right? Then you want to test the model. You need another test set to calibrate the model. This test set cannot be too different from the calibration set in terms of statistical properties. So it would be unfair to calibrate model on small peaks and then suddenly feed it with big peaks in test set, right? It's unfair. Some managers like to do it, it's called crash test. And in HES, by the way, you know HES journal, Hydrology and Earth System Sciences? Uh, there is a paper published, it's in interactive discussion, so it's now in a review process, but in interactive discussion, read it, it's about crash test. Very nice paper, actually. So crash test says, okay, let's feed some strange data into the model and see if it works. You can do it, but it's unfair. You should have given also this crash data to the model during calibration. Then it would learn how to handle peaks. So my point is here that when you calibrate the model, then you should test it on the data which model hasn't seen, but it shouldn't be too different. All right, we test the model, and it gives you bad result. Imagine, possible. What do we do next? Ideas. Don't look at this picture now, let's discuss. So you, you have two data sets, one calibration, one test set. Test says bad model, large error. What do we do next? Sorry, again? Again? mix to merge them yes. okay. and to use for calibration. Okay, it's often done, good idea. So we merge this data set, calibrate the model, you get a bit different model. It works well. It works well, say, okay. But how to test it now? We have no data more left. We used all the data for calibration. You take one part out, and then you test your module on the data left. But we did it in the first step. We took all the data, we took part for calibration, and the rest was for testing. E Sorry? Invert them. Okay. Uh, invert them, fine, also possible. So then you said this. Uh -huh. We calibrated the model on test one, we tested it on test two, not good. Ah, let's use test uh, set two <coughs> to calibrate and test on, on test one or set one. And if it's good, model is good. But I think you didn't do enough somehow. And it's a trick. Uh, because maybe it's just chance that it happened like this. Or what if it calibrated on second test Second set, it works badly on first set. What to do then? Similar situation. It's unsolvable problem, I can tell you. 
the solution is to introduce the third set. So what we do, we introduce the set number three, which is called cross-validation set. So what we do is this. We first calibrate the model on this set. And then we, so why do we need testing set? Uh, let's return back. Why test? Test set imitates operation of the model in real life, right? So we build the model, we give it to the, uh, those who ordered this model, and then model goes to operation, and we imitate operation by test set, imitation. Uh, in real life, there could be different data, but this we cannot predict. So we assume we know the future on the test set, and we imitate data on the test set. Why don't we do this now? We calibrate model here, and then we imitate test set by yet another test set, which is called cross-validation set. So we would test the model, which is here, built here, by this set. If it's okay, then it's okay. If it's not okay, then we do something more. And this set we cannot use at all to change the model. This set should be secret, hidden from the model builder, and being located in the safe of the final person who would pay you. You have to have an agreement that this set statistically more or less similar to this set, otherwise it's unfair. But if it's fair, then this set you should not see. Otherwise, if you are paid based on the error on the test set, you would calibrate the model on the test set, ignoring these sets because you don't need it, you are not paid for this. You minimize error on the test set, you paid maximum bonus, and you go home with the money, and model is bad, because you never tested it on other data. See my point? So you cannot use test set to change the model. You should stop changing the model here, and the data available for you. And this is secret set, which should be hidden from you. That's the theory of modeling. This is how properly you should do the model calibration validation and testing. That's how, what th theory says. Often it's not done, it's a pity, but you should have in mind that this is the best way to do it. Problem is, often you don't have all this data, you don't have enough years, and so on and so on, so you then violate this rule. But if you have a lot of data, 40 years or 20 years of data, you use, uh, I don't know, 10 years here, three years here, and three years here, and it would be a good test. Okay? That's the theory. So, secret set, <laughs> it's used to test the model after it is built, after only, and it don't change it, you don't have the right to change it. Of course, then you can say, okay, let's do agreement, we have more data, let's recalibrate on the whole set, what you suggested, and you in a way, so why don't we do it? Okay, can be done, but it's already a deviation from the theory. When we discuss data-driven models, we'll discuss how to use cross-validation set to uh, improve the model on calibration. But for the time being, I think I confused you enough to talk about this. Okay, we, re we will return back to these three data sets later when we could uh, talk about neural networks. So, ideally, you should, of course, try to minimize error on calibration set, but having in mind that you, in fact, have to minimize error on cross-validation set. Because this set, for you, when you're building the model here, imitates future model operation. So it means you want to minimize model error on future model operation, of course. See? That's what uh, you should do. So, in fact, you should look at both, somehow. And later we'll discuss in more detail. Right. In red, it says, if data is bad, calibration is a bad idea. We discussed this, obviously. Don't push the model too close to the data when you assume data is not very good. No sense of doing this. So try to be reasonable. Sometimes you don't have any choice. So don't push the model to strange values. You may end up with a nice model with low error, but physical properties of this model, if you look into it, would be very, something strange. So better trust physics than trust data. Because physics is forever and data could be erroneous. And physics is not erroneous. If you understand physics well. Right. 
So I think it's uh, said enough here. Let's look at some examples of using modeling in water-related issues. So urban water. You sometimes often use it urban water, right, here. So urban water is a challenge to modeling. So there is a complex, so waters in uh, cities are uh, conveyed by uh, pipes and by channels, canals. So complex structures in different cities is done differently. Uh, canals are sedimentation, uh, pollution, uh, you know, garbage control, uh, all this. Pipes are aging, they're leaking. You often don't know where these pipes are, what quality of these pipes, properties. Look at the pictures, pipes look like this, you know, they're all destroyed, so it's a very complex system. Also, it's a lot is underground, so you don't have full observation. At the rivers, you go there, look at it, and you understand everything, and pipes, it's all hidden. So that's a complex uh, issue, assets, urban assets uh, with unknown characteristics. So you cannot build models when you don't know friction, you don't know how much water is leaking, difficult problem. So. Uh, urban infrastructure, well, this example of using ArcGIS, there is a component called 3D Analyst, and this is in Denmark, in one of the towns, uh, the pipe network is presented by GIS. Very impressive, you know, nice uh, tools you can use. But often, all these pipes are drawn like this, but in fact, uh, maybe it's not true. So, so uh, water distribution systems. Uh, many people, and uh, consulting agencies used EPANET software, which was developed by Environmental Protection Agency of United States uh, of uh, America, and this is software for water distribution systems uh, modeling. So it's used uh, widely uh, to model uh, pressurized uh, networks, or pressurized networks, because they use equations assuming pressure, pressurized flows. If flow is not pressurized, it means free flow, then uh, you use some other tools, like uh, SWIM, where you solve uh, Navier-Stock, uh, sorry, San Venant equations uh, for uh, free, uh, flow, free surface flow. So uh, it's used for network design and operation, leakage control, demand management, asset management in many tasks, and it's running operationally in many, many water ath ath authorities seems to be reliable software. There are other, also other packages, but they are all quite similar in functionality. Yes, um, sorry, but um, they did a question about uh, calibration. Can I yes. okay. go back to it? Sure. Uh, they asked how to calibrate a model when you don't have observed flow data. You cannot. <laughs> As I said, if you, no data, no model. So, but if you study physics well, if you understand the natural system, you look at other models, other studies, you know properties of soil in hydrology, then you put some parameters based on uh, soil maps, for example. It's often done. W for distributed models, uh, uh, soil maps uh, quite present in many countries. You have quite accurate representation of soils maybe not to a square meter, but to a large areas. And then you know soil properties for these models, for this type of soils. And then you set up parameters to these values from these uh, catalogs. So it means that these parameters become measurable. If they're measurable, if you know their values, you would put them in the mo model and run the model, no problem. Because you calibrate parameters when you don't know them then you need to compare output to the measured output, and then you choose parameters to minimize the error. If you can measure parameters, you put them in the model and run it. Especially when you don't have output measured, then whatever you get from the model, you have to trust it or not, it's up to you. That's how it is. Life is complex. Did I answer the question? I, I guess if they... You trust I did. Yeah. Thank you. For sure you did. <laughs> other questions from the other side of the world? No, but yeah. I okay, will. good question actually. And maybe I should have mentioned, especially for distributed models, the soil properties. For lumped models, you don't have measured uh, parameters, you understand, because it's aggregated parameter, you cannot measure it. But for distributed models, you can do it. Right. So, returning back to now application. So, Urban networks of sewers and drainage. 
often combined, sometimes separate sewer, separate drainage. In some cities, it's combined uh, sewer systems. So uh, two types of soft, different software packages are used. Often you swim, again, from uh, EPA USA, uh, which is free. Uh, at least the component you get from them. But there are other layers built on top which you have to buy. But most important component is free. And another one is Mike Urban, which was called Mouse before, but now it's called Mike Urban. Mike Urban is a software package from Danish Hydraulic Institute, where you have a mouse system in it, but also Swim is installed part of it because many people use it, so you can run them uh, both. They're all both good. DHI says mouse is better because it's used better numerical solver, by the way. Maybe it's true, but uh, anyway, you can use uh, both, whatever you have at your disposal. So these models would calculate for you uh, the flows in the pipes. But if you have too much flow, then there would be openings and flow would reach the streets. Okay? And you can calculate the, in terms of flood management, you see this picture here. Okay? So water comes to the streets and this is overflow. And you can calculate volume of these flood waters that come to the streets. More, this water may reach another point and get back to the system. So you can calculate this as well. So it's, it's a complex model. It's not only the water comes to the streets, never comes back. It may come back. So you have to handle this water again. So this is widely used in urban water management. For us, the problem here is to assess flood damage. So if urban water system works, you don't care. It carries the water away from the city during rain, heavy rainfall. But if flood is happening, we want to assess how much flood would be happening, how much uh, city would be flooded, and so on. So this is when you use these models. Can you use them in predictive mode? Yes, if you have forecasts of rainfalls. Okay, If you have forecasts of rainfalls, you can feed this rainfall into the system, and you calculate how much uh, city would be flooded. Now, for models, we discussed this already. Uh, for accurate um, distributed modeling, <coughs> you need um, uh, LIDAR data, for example. It's airborne laser scanning. So LIDAR data, give, it's expensive, but it gives you very accurate representation of urban environment up to uh, height of the curbs and st stuff like this. So. Sometimes it's useful, but sometimes it's not because you cannot accurately model flow of the city and you cannot have all these details. So, uh, but it really helps to build uh, accurate models if you have full, full data uh, represented. Okay, this is some of the examples of uh, LiDAR images. When the plane goes or the car even drives uh, uh, along the city and scans the city and then they have wonderful DMs of the city with all these uh, buildings and everything else uh, that you have. Problem is trees, of course. When you have a tree, you, you don't know what's happening. So because water would run under the tree, but tree shows as if the water has an obstacle, but it's not. So that's something to handle. Now, look at this. This is real picture what's happening uh, underground. Okay, pipes, cables, God knows what. Sometimes Adri Fervey, our uh, colleague who did a lot of in urban modeling, he is demonstrating photos at CPT, I don't have it, what you have under the ground. You have the conduit, the huge pipes going through the city. They assume to carry the water away from the city during uh, floods, heavy storm, rainfall, uh, rainstorms. But then you see in the middle of the pipe there is a, some you know, piece of metal of this size is there. How did it get there? Nobody knows. It was maybe 50 years ago, you know, and it blocks all the flow. And model doesn't know about this. It thinks water flows, but it doesn't. So uh, all this stuff, because it's under the ground. So that's a problem. Right. Models are used for river basin and floods. 1D flood simulation. Okay, it's an example of using, it's in uh, Nice, southern France, uh, often heavy uh, rain forms, uh, uh, rainstorms, um, uh, rivers are sometimes blocks, uh, gravel is taken out of the rivers uncontrollably, not only in France, sorry, maybe in France not, but in other places I know people come to take gravel of the uh, rivers from the bottom, river becomes deeper, 
hydraulic regime changes, nobody knows where uh, things change, and it may change in, a, in, in several days considerably. So flood may come in the place when you would never expect, because they take sand and gravel from the bottom of the uh, rivers. So it's an uh, uncontrollable uh, uh, process. Okay, let's skip this uh, quickly. So I want to show you the output of uh, Mike 11. So you can, in 1D modeling systems, you can the profile of the water along the, the uh, cross section. And for every point, you can see <coughs> how high water is in that uh, point and what is the flow. So calculation would allow you to see if at a certain level of the river, you would have over overland flow, that your floodplain would be uh, covered with water. And if you have even 1D model, you can simply, by simple GIS operation, calculate how much uh, DEM of your DEM would be flooded. In this way, you can forecast where flood would be. You don't have velocities in 1D model, but if you have water levels, it's already not bad. So you can have already assessment of flood. But if you have want to have accurate modeling of flooding, you have to move to 2D models, as I said, because flow in the river is very different from the flow across the floodplains, because its, uh, it's, uh, its properties are uh, very different. So the processes themselves are different. So you see, you can see here overtopping banks, and by this you can warn the people uh, if uh, there is a problem. Okay, this Czech Republic's Czech Republic. So one of the integrated systems for flood management where we use model is called Mike Flood Watch. So DHI combine different components into one, including GIS, Mike 11, advanced time series database, and such like. And many companies are doing this nowadays. They install systems that allow you to do many things. So it's not only modeling, but it's also database, data management, analytical work, and also receiving signals from uh, gauging and from numerical weather prediction models, automatically feeding all these uh, forecasts of rainfalls into hydraulic and hydrological models. So it's an example how it works, but it works for many systems in a very uh, uh, similar fashion. So you see a real-time monitored data is fed into the models. So we have links across internet or other communication lines to inputs from numerical weather prediction models or gauging. And it would give you possibility to calculate real-time the forecasts, hydrological forecasts. Okay. One of the systems is called Delphuse. Did you, are you using it in Brazil? Delphuse, no? So that's a system that what you see here is a shell. So you can feel, put your own models into the system, but it gives you the platform with databases and links to the numerical weather prediction models that would feed you uh, the data. It's a nice system installed on many water authorities around the world. In the United States, only, I think, 300 installations. In the United Kingdom as well. So it's quite successful. And again, this system doesn't have any model in it. It's purely shell, empty shell. But you can plug in, using interfaces, plug in different models into HBV, Deltares model, Sobek, Mike 11, whatever you like. So all these models then would work together. OK, that's one of the examples of uh, DHI, which is uh, showing how the things work. Let me show you animation on this. So you see this is rainfall. And time runs hourly time steps, you see here. And this is extrapolation. It's interpolation, sorry, from gauging of rainfall to present rainfall field. <coughs> this is water levels now observed. Let me show you. And flood status, sorry, flood status, alarm or normal. So you see alarm level here. It's water levels. In this river, you can see that alarm level would exceed, the level would exceed the level uh, on a certain day. So this gives you visualization of the uh, forecasts run through the models and then uh, displayed in this way for uh, water managers. So there are many installations similar fashion. I'm sure in Brazil you also use similar installations and they're coming from different companies. Innovise, which is formerly 
Wallingford Software, for example, DHI, Deltaris, and other companies, and small companies around the world. So all of them have similar installations of different. So this is already water level forecast. You see this forecast? No alarm levels, all green, all nice. So forecast says nothing. You see alarm very high, so this is no problem here at all. It's a forecast of water levels in the rivers. So this system in, in was is in operation since year 2000 already. So it's already so many years in, uh, and since then technology advanced and you have even more sophisticated system. But this is one of the first actually systems where on the in the browser you can see all these results. The DHI did a good work. It's already how many years ago? Already you can see it. It was Netscape browser. It doesn't exist anymore understand correctly. Okay, so then we return back to our presentation. So that was using models for flood management. So I showed you these animations already. So this is uh, architecture of a hydroinformatic system that we built in one of the projects for uh, Greece in Athens. It was a project that allowed us sort of to combine different things in one. <coughs> and on this, I can show you typical components of a system where models <coughs> and data combine. So look, this is the database which collects all the data, and data comes from meteorological models, uh, models runs, uh, which are run elsewhere, which give you the forecasts of rainfall. You have also hydrologic hydraulic models, so inputs go into these hydraulic models through the main interface. So they come here, they're processed here, and they fed into the hydrological uh, model. There is also telemetric data, which means gauging. Gauges, in, in Athens you have flash floods, so systems from Mediterranean come hit the mountains and suddenly you have rainfall and suddenly you have floods. In four hours, you may have catastrophic floods in the city, so that fast. So you have not much time to react. But three or four hours is already a lot, because people can be warned and, uh, you know, to do something about this. So this should work very fast. So it means you collect data, you should inform public in, uh, in fast manner. So that's why we have here uh, the communication module by email, FTP, HTML, uh, web pages, radio, and so on, public is warned. And this system was developed already 15 years ago. And this is uh, interface developed by one of our PhD students, actually, in Delphi. So we used the uh, GIS component here. And these points here show the, the uh, alarm levels coded from green to yellow to red. Uh, for the river flows in this catchment. So forecast is then again run through the hydrological model and hydraulic models and we could calculate points of, uh, of uh, a problem. Right now it already seems outdated but in fact it has all the components which modern interfaces have already then. So it's already developed technology and there are tools to build it so don't feel it's uh, you know extremely uh, difficult. So, of course, you can buy these solutions from consulting companies, and maybe this is what you should be doing. But it costs money, of course, so they would charge you a lot. So if you feel you have somebody who could code things, you then may take free tools like Delphi Fuse, for example. It's free, and if you learn how to use it, you can add these components to it, and then it's maybe much cheaper. Professional level maybe would not be as high as what professional consultants would deliver, like Innovise or Deltaris or DHI or whoever, but you should start somewhere, at least for some authorities with, with low budgets. Again, there are already tools that allow you to construct such systems. It needs knowledge of coding, of course, but it's always like this. All right, that's an example of Deltares. Uh, you see how nice it is. This is reservoir, this is Varagamba Dam, and uh, it's all nice, but 
Australian authorities asked Deltaris to run SOBIC model, it was called Del Delf Hydraulics then, uh, to see if what happens if them would break. Okay, it's a noble thing, so let me go again and run Varagamba. Where is Varagamba? I don't see it. Maybe it's not here. No, sorry, it's not in this folder, so I will not run it. But there is a picture. Ah, animation runs? No. No, cannot. So you can see that uh, using 2D modeling, Deltaris was able to show what will be flooded if them breaks. Okay, bad, but anyway, it's what if analysis. What if the dam breaks? That's how we use the models. And in this way, you can uh, demonstrate to managers what will happen if them breaks. I'm not sure it helps much, because if them breaks, then it will kill a lot of people. And, but you cannot prevent it if it breaks. If it doesn't break, then why do you need it? Because it doesn't break, then you're happy. But anyway, it's useful. All right, colleagues. So no, we didn't reach this. We still have time, right? Uh huh. Just a bit more. Yeah. Yes. Models beyond traditional simulation models. What we discussed now is simulation models. We didn't. I didn't show you really hydraulic models, which are real simulation models because they solve differential equations. But its whole uh, principle of modeling is physically based models. Now, what is data-driven models? We'll have special lectures on this, so it's very brief introduction. Data-driven model uses numerical data, which uh, <coughs> was measured when certain physical process was running. What we want to build is the function that will link inputs to outputs. We want to build input-out mod model. Okay. This is general modeling system. You have input data. It is going to real system, like rainfall, for example. Then you have actual observed output. And you have machine learning data-driven model, uh, or any other model, by the way. And you want to minimize this error. It means difference between what real system, uh, what is observed in real system, and what is in the predicted uh, output y. Okay, That's what you do. So data-driven model, terminology used is this. The data-driven model tries to learn the target function f this function that links x, x to y. Strange why we use this term learn, but in machine learning that's the terminology used, but basically our physically based model also learns. Right? When we calibrate it, it also learns. But this is the process of learning is then process of minimizing the difference between observed data and model output. So What is the, imagine you are collecting data about rainfall and flow. And you collected 1, 2, 3, uh, I think 14, so 3, 3, 9, 10, 13 records shown by blue points. Okay? So what is then, uh, can you build a model that would encapsulate all this knowledge about the relationship between x and y? Can you do it? I suggest this model. So click, yes. We optimize, optimize, and we build this model. Is it a good model? Not bad. So it goes through this set, right? So now we can throw away these 13 points and use green model to predict. How do we predict? If new x is coming here, we then feed this value x to the model, green model, and we calculate y. This would be your prediction of the output, isn't it? And what about this model? Which one is better? Well, I can tell you, this model is closer to the points. If you calculate error, it's a bit more accurate. 
It's a bit more complex because first model had only two parameters. It's a linear model. And the red model is quadratic model. So it has three parameters. So it's more ac more complex model. But it's more accurate. So perhaps to use it. But you remember I told you that the best model is the model with smallest error. Still, these models have errors. You see, they don't exactly go through points. So I suggest to use this model, blue one. It has zero error, and this is what you want, isn't it? Tell me, am I right or not? Interesting point, right? So what is said is that there would be more uncertainty because there are many more parameters. Indeed, in this model, you have many parameters. So it's very complex. It's a complex polynomial model. Many parameters, yes. But, look, original aim was to build the accurate model, this absolutely accurate model. It goes through all 13 points exactly. Error is zero. Okay, many parameters, so what? Okay, it works. So which one model would you prefer? Green, red, or blue? <coughs> Any suggestions? Maybe our remote audience? I see some questions here coming up. Oh yes, this one we answered. Mm -hmm. Which one would you prefer? Who likes simple? Who likes more complex? End of the day, I know. Difficult. I see it on your faces. Okay, I will answer this question when we discuss data-driven models. I will not answer it now to create a bit of suspense, a bit of interest. Okay, so I will not answer this question. Okay, this we will discuss during data-driven course. Last, p yes? New question, okay, I see the new question, let me see it. Okay, I am reading out the question. If my objective is to predict flood events for basins which are between 500 and 2,000 square kilometers, how can I assess the appropriate temporal resolution for my model? Daily, hourly, sub-hourly? Yes, uh, good question uh, and easy to answer that I don't know because you need much more information than this. I su suspect sub-hourly data is not needed. It's too much. Even hourly data, hourly data is nice but I would work with the first daily data because it's much easier to get. So daily data allows you to create general picture of this. But look, it depends on the also slope in the catchment. If this catchment is mountainous catchment, then it may happen that concentration of rainwater would be much faster uh, amplified downstream than in the flat catchments, right, where it's all distributed. So it also depends on physical properties of the catchment, not only uh, on its uh, size. Sub hourly data is practically impossible to collect. Hourly data sometimes, <coughs> but also not uh, often. So it could be six hours data or uh, daily data. But again, it depends on the physical system, which we don't know what it is. I'm not sure I answered this question, but maybe at least partly. Right. So let me finish this uh, lecture on modeling systems with an idea, and we could discuss it later a bit more. So idea is this. Why don't we not build one model of a physical system, but build separate models that would represent different sub-processes that are happening? So what we do is this. For high flows, we build model one. For mid medium flows, we build model two. And for low flows, we build model three. Why is that? In theory, you can say water flows can be described by one set of equations. But in fact, what's happening in low flows and high flows is quite different. 
equations could be also different. When you have overland flow, equations are already different, and so on. So why don't we build separate models for, dif for uh, different regimes? So these multi-regime models are not really widely used, but it's maybe an idea to think about. And we publish several papers on this, and also other people are publishing, when a model for rising limb of hydrograph would be one component, and another model for receding limb of the hydrograph. So that's an idea for you to think about as a possible research uh, topic, by the way. So it's an interesting thing to do and to test if it's worth doing or not. Maybe your one model is good enough, then why to bother? But if it's not good, then maybe it's better to build several models combining them optimally. And then uh, for moments of low flows, if you have data, you would build data, calibrate the model on this data for low flows, you see? And for high flows, you will calibrate another model for high flows. And then you somehow optimally combine them. So we developed something called fuzzy committee of models. There was a paper in 2007 and 2011, I think, uh, uh, with Finice and uh, uh, Nagendra Kayasta uh, on using this optimal combination of models. What we also did, uh, we took Dutch HBV semi-distributed model of Maas River, or Meus in Dutch, or Maas in English. So this is a river which uh, goes through several countries and ends up here in the Netherlands. Delft is somewhere here. And what uh, our analysis shown that some components of this model, there are 15 sub-models, and some of them were good and some of them were not good. So what we did with Gerald Corso, and in his PhD he did it actually, we repli replaced one of the sub components of this HBV model by neural network, and overall model performance improved. So this is then hybrid model combining physically based component and neural network component, data driven model. So that's also something to think about. Okay, let's skip this. And this material I will not cover today, we leave it for the future. Right, any questions? so far, because we have to stop now. Any further questions? So what we did today, ah, question, yes. How did he choose to use neural network just in that subcatchment? Why? Because we found that there are 15 submodels in HBV semi-distributed component, and we, uh, analyzed performance of all of them. Variable performance, but the worst was this one. So, and we had data to train input-output model. So we, then we said, okay, we're not caring too much about reproducing physics, but we want to reproduce input-output relationship of rainfall and flow here. So we took out, out of HBV the lumped conceptual, this component, which we discussed, and we put in another type of model and connected it to the rest. And all the rest, if you measure uh, flow at Lobith, it's entering Netherlands here. So if we run this model, then error model error here reduced. So that's why we do it. We just take out bad component and put a good one. So that's what we did. So check papers with search for Corso Solomatin 2007-2008. We published this in Hydrological Sciences Journal, I think. Yeah. Further questions? So what we did today, we looked at general principles of modeling. It was very fast, of course, and too general maybe to make it uh, useful, but at least to put different things together and to build a sort of uh, this picture of uh, how data streams through the different types of models and reaches the decision uh, making. And we looked mainly at uh, theory of modeling. I think for us it's important to understand that the models have inputs, outputs, and states, and we played a bit with this model, which you are welcome to calibrate further. Very simple hydrological model. So what we'll do now next is we'll look at optimization, and we will look at 
uh, data-driven models because this material, which is not, uh, you know, maybe you have didn't have it during your courses and other models you perhaps studied uh, already. So that's what my plan for the coming days. So thank you very much. So then uh, soon there will be this lecture. Let me maybe move some slides around for this audience who will be coming. Minister of Water of Brazil, no? <laughs> Okay, anyway. Okay, so I, I suppose audience is welcome to, yes, yeah, to stay, right? Uh, okay. Mandatory for oh, mandatory. Okay. Sure. Serious. Okay, good. Okay, so we'll have a break now. Yes. Good, thank you.